On the 17th of July, a tweet would appear on people's timelines. A tweet that many people in the community thought they would never see. This image alone would end an eight-year-long journey, filled with hundreds of thousands of failed attempts. I would absolutely love to tell you the story of this moment. I want to show you the players that made this happen, why it took so long, and why it matters to so many people in this community. If there's one thing that I've noticed from my past two videos, it's that a lot of you actually had Geometry Dash downloaded on your phone at least once or maybe even twice. Even if it was just for 10 minutes, you probably had it on your phone and you probably also played it. You see, back in 2014 to 15, the game sort of exploded in popularity all around the world. More and more children were getting access to mobile phones and it seems like games were at the peak of popularity, at least when it comes to my generation. Which, by the way, it's not a generation that has a lot to show for itself. A warning for parents tonight. The Tide Pod Challenge is the latest fad among teens on social media. Teens are challenging others to put a pod in That's a marshmallow. Bite down. All of a sudden, you would see certain mobile games come and go in the circles at school. You'd have entire friend groups playing Clash of Clans together or Subway Surfers. Out of all of the games that we played back then, only one stuck around with me. Not because I love seeing a square jump over spikes, but because it had something I had never seen before. Geometry Dash is a very simple game. As a player, you control this icon and your only goal is to reach the end of the level without touching any obstacles that come your way. You are constantly moving to the right, so your one and only task is to press the jump button at the right moments to survive. However, if you thought the game would stay this simple, you better give yourself a good old clapperino because trust me, things get crazy. You see, the square is only one of seven game modes that the game has to offer. Harder levels down the line will throw multiple gameplay swapping portals at you and it's up to you to keep up. All of these abide by the same one input rule. There is only one jump button to press, but what happens to the player after that button is pressed is determined by what game mode you are in. For the ship, it's a simple increase in vertical velocity the longer you hold the button. For the UFO, it's like Flappy Bird where you can do multiple jumps midair. For the wave, it makes you ascend in a 45 degree angle. And so on. I won't bore you with the specifics of every game mode since they kinda bore me too. Now, imagine taking all of these gameplay mechanics, donating a bunch of basic blocks and designs to use, adding triggers that can manipulate things during gameplay, and then you tell every single player that they can do whatever they want with them. What is this now? <sighs> Dude, do you actually need this many locks on your goddamn door? Do not touch those locks. It's not something a mere simpleton like you would understand. All right, fair enough. No, I get it, I get it. What are you doing anyway? I don't know man, I was watching a video and all of a sudden it says it's blocked in my country or something. I, I, I don't get it. Dude, we don't even live in a country. I know, right? I didn't know you could read. Huh? 
we probably all have experienced something like this. May it be a video game, a certain show, or even just a simple YouTube video. Absolutely idiotic copyright laws and some very intrusive governments will be there to make your life harder and block these in your country. Dude, are you actually doing a sponsorship right now? Which is why I'm happy to announce this video is officially sponsored by NordVPN. With NordVPN, you can place your computer anywhere on Earth, completely bypassing any restrictions your government, internet service provider or mother give you. With a simple one-button press, you can pretend to be in Paris, in Italy, in the United States, <laughs> or even in the seventh circle of hell. We all have our own reasons. You can watch shows no matter in which country you are stuck in, buy games at discounts because they cost less in other countries, prevent your ISP from throttling your internet speed just because they don't like the website that you are on. And the best part is, NordVPN allows you to do all of that fast, but most importantly, securely. If any of this sounds like it would help you in your day-to-day -day life, head on over to nordvpn.com slash smy. Hey, psst. With this code, you get an exclusive deal you wouldn't get otherwise. Are you gonna tell them that you misspelled your own name when we asked you what your promo code should yeah, be? Man, no one needed to know. I right, shut. Now that you've seen what's possible, I hope you can also see what hooked me to this game. It was the level editor, and more importantly, the creators that were using it. From creating ridiculously stunning levels that have thousands of objects, to coding their own game in Geometry Dash, to literally recreating the movie Shrek using artificial intelligence. The community has done some absolutely insane things over the years. It feels like players were given a limitless amount of tools with which they can basically do anything with. But this is only one side of the game. After all, what would level creators be without players to play their levels? And trust me, on the player side of the game, people have managed to do stuff that's just as impressive. Let me show you. This is the first level in the game. A simple introduction to the first two game modes. If you spend a few days playing, 13 main levels down the line, you will meet Club Step. This is the first demon difficulty rated level that you will encounter. Here, you have to balance the majority of game modes plus gameplay elements like orbs and pads. On top of that, the level introduces fake pathways and very difficult timings. This one took me hundreds of attempts to beat, and I remember getting really, really frustrated. And this is what people in the community are doing while you are crying on Clubstep. Yes, 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 I have yes, thousands yes. of hours in this game and I still don't understand how people do this. If you watched my Impossible Levels video, you know how this came to be. You know what led to these players becoming so good at this game. And in the end of that video, I talk about a very specific level. A level that stood unbeaten, cheated, hacked for almost eight years. The level's name was Silent Clubstep. It all started seven years ago, when a very well-respected and known player by the name of Sobros decided to showcase the level on his YouTube channel. This was, what many people believe, the catalyst to the level becoming so widely known. After it was thrown into the limelight, it slowly started getting more and more attention, until it eventually snowballed into one giant meme. The level was so ridiculous that it was cross-referenced everywhere in the community as the hardest level out there. If you were in the community, you knew about this level. And so did everyone else. And I'm here to show you why. With a level editor present, it was pretty obvious from the start that not everyone would use it to create normal levels. Do not make me come over there, all right? Silent Clubstep is a really good example of a level that shouldn't exist. You see, to fully explain what I mean, you first need to know that in the early days of Geometry Dash, a triple spike was considered a pretty hard skill check for casual players. 
Three spikes in a row are as far as you can jump at normal speeds, so they require you to hit a pretty tight timing to survive. In Silent Club Step, however, the first jump of the level is four spikes. So what's going on here? In the editor, you actually are not required to align every single object you place on the grid. So what Salent, the creator of Silent Club Step did, was put four spikes next to another and then squish them together, which just barely makes the jump possible. The first jump is basically a perfect analogy of the entire level. Every single section hits you like a right hook from Rocky. Do people even know who that is anymore? Like, am I too old? Come here, you f***ing son of a bitch. The entire level is filled with these jumps and timings that basically were made to be frame perfect. But saying these jumps are frame perfect would kinda be a lie, which is something that I will get into later. This is a good example of why the level became so infamous. It isn't just another hard level you can beat with thousands of attempts and hours of practice. This is a concrete wall that body checks every player that even dares to slightly look in its direction. I could go over every single timing in this level and explain why they are so ridiculous, but I would be wasting your time with a lot of small fish. Small fish that still are the spawn of Satan, don't get me wrong, but instead of doing that, let's talk about the actual leviathans that make this level so infamous. These border on the line of what's humanly possible. If the first jump was a cake, this section would be the bugger 293 on top. By now, you should kind of have a rough idea of how the ship game mode works. Over the years, the community developed a specific skill called straight flying. This is required for when levels throw stuff like this at you. There's no way you make it through these tight corridors of spikes unless you tap in really fast but precise rhythms to keep the ship perfectly straight. This is way harder than these players make it seem and it is a skill that has been refined and trained for over 8 years now. So how about we throw all of that out of the window and make a straight fly corridor that isn't straight at all. This abomination not only isn't even straight, but features these four wacky silly spikes that for some reason need to be lower than the others, making this basically everything but a straight fly. On top of that, the creator Salem decided we need a mirror portal and a gravity switch portal halfway in, basically removing any last chance of trying to see where you are. Do not forget, you're doing all of this in almost complete darkness. I tried recording footage of this thing for this video, but I had to slow down my game to 0.25 speed. I couldn't even make it past the first three spikes with that, so I enjoy some no-clip footage. You're welcome. You might have noticed that sometimes the player icon overlaps with spikes or obstacles, but I don't die. This works because existence itself is an illusion and you should never trust anyone. Not even yourself. Hitboxes in this game are weird. Instead of following common sense and making them the same size as the texture, the developer of the game was forced by some mysterious entity to disobey basic geometry. Just like me in preschool. <laughs> Wait a f***ing second. This red box is the part of the spike that the player actually interacts with. The mere contact with this red mystery square will completely dissolve you and your loved ones. So maybe don't touch it. I know how hard it can be. I'll come back for you, my friend. Understanding hitboxes can help a player navigate levels easier, with a good example actually being in Silent Club Step. After surviving the first 4%, you reach this corridor with a dual portal. This portal duplicates the player and changes the gravity of the clone. You control both of these with the same click, which gets absurdly confusing if you're not careful. To pass this section, you need to first memorize which of these spikes actually kill you and which ones are fakes. This quad spike jump is a bit special because whether intentional or not, the best way to tackle it is by hitbox cheesing it. So. Let's turn on the hitbox cheat. You can see that these flat spikes actually have one of the worst hitboxes in the game and we can totally abuse that. By landing on the corner of this block, we basically skip the fourth spike. This is something we could not survive if the hitboxes were actually accurate. This is why you can see the ship touching spikes and still surviving in the straight fly section. 
Keep this in mind for whenever you see players touching things that look like obstacles. They either are hollow objects with no hitboxes or have really inaccurate ones to begin with. Players in this game have the hitboxes of almost every single object memorized. It's a necessary skill because it allows you to take more leeway in certain situations. The flat spike, as previously mentioned, is one of the worst offenders here, but some other funny hitboxes include the saws and whatever these guys are up to. The straight fly is by far the level's most infamous section. It clearly was built with nothing but pain in mind, and that's why it's considered the hardest part of the level. You encounter this part right at the start, from 6 to 10%. You would think that because it's so close to the beginning, you could throw more attempts at it, right? Well, it's not that simple. To get to the first ship part, you would first have to pass the insanity that is the first few jumps. And it just so turns out that that is a feat that actually took quite a while to happen. And it's exactly here where our story begins. When Sobros showcased the level on his YouTube channel, it took him 974 attempts in practice mode to reach the end. I'm sure tons of other people actually went and tried the level after, but they probably never made it past the second jump until one month later. Emirate became the first person ever to reach the ship part without using practice mode, except he probably wasn't. It's very likely that a bunch of people actually had done this before Emirate, but they didn't record it, like Sobras. Emirate was the first recorded proof, so I'll put his name here with a shiny asterisk. It says a lot about a level when seven years later, people still upload videos of them achieving 6%. It took an entire month to reach it. And now people were finally facing the harsh reality of this level. Players were coming to terms with the fact that attempting to get any further than 6% was pretty much futile. The ship part alone was just too brutal. In the comments of Emirates video, you can get a glimpse of how players' mindsets were back then. My best is 20%, but I forgot to record. Sure. Well done, but I think that flying part is impossible. Wait a minute, that's the creator, that's silent. I have the world record of 100%. I'll upload very soon. Over the years, tons of people have claimed world records, but 90% of the time, they were lying. Like, dirty, lying Larrys. Tons of people reached 6% after Emirates, but progress would stop dead in its track right here. It was hard enough to reach this point to begin with, so people stopped playing the level, at least from the start. You see, some players started hunting practice runs. The goal was simple. In just how many attempts could you clear this level? At this point in time, Sobras held the world record with 974 attempts. And I'm sure there were a bunch of people who beat this score, but the first big improvement that I want to highlight is this one. The date is November 25th, 2016. A really well-known player by the name of Sonix just verified what was at the time the hardest level ever to be legitimately beaten. Coming off of that high, he was looking to test his own abilities. So, a day later, he started a practice run of Silent Clubstep. At this time, Sonix was considered the overall best player in the community. So, naturally, in this practice run, he tried living up to that name. And he delivered. 495 attempts. This basically cut Sobers' attempt count in half. It showed that the overall standard for skill had risen. Maybe, finally, players had caught up with the level and could try beating 6%. Radio silence. We are now in 2018. Three years after the level was released, and all we could manage was 6% and 495 attempts in practice. It seriously was looking bad. Almost as if people were just letting the level fall into the shadows of the community. But if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's that you can always count on somebody showing up. Seven percent. Oh my god! Yo, we actually did it! It took roughly three years, but it seems that Earthrex was not deterred by that at all. 
for the sake of transparency, we actually have no way of knowing if Earthrex actually was the first person to survive decently far into the straight fly. In the video itself, he says this. Yo, I'm the third person in the world. Now I, I did nine. it. But then again, he also titled the video First in the World. So it seems that nobody really knew where the record stood and that everyone was kind of just going off of what they heard from others. With so many lying Larrys around, you could never know if you truly were the first to do something. But to the best of my knowledge, I could not find any videos dating earlier than Earthrex's 7%. I found this video by the player Error that got uploaded just two days after Earthrex showcased his 7%. In the description, Error states that it took him 20,000 attempts to reach 7%. Error also mentions two to three other players on the in-game leaderboards that apparently had reached 7% and even 8% before both of them. But again, there's no video proof, so these might as well be considered cheated. Let this be a public service announcement to anyone out there doing weird obscure challenges in video games. Press the record button. Even if your sex percent speedrun gets lost to the endless drag of time, you have proof that you truly were the first to bang Magnolia in under 12 minutes. And who knows, maybe in the future some weirdo comes along and mentions you in the Geometry Dash video. <laughs> A fate worse than death. The 1159! Fucking yes, dude. Sub 12. 7% was a tiny but really important step forward. Although it didn't get that much recognition, it still showed that there were players that were willing to fight, even if it's 1% at a time. And just like with 6%, this is where the brutality of this ship section really showed its fangs again. 2018 and going forward, nobody would be able to match Earthrex's run. It seemed like a repeat of 6%, where the level would go completely silent. Clapster. But this time only for a year. In 2019, Pyrrhil Colley almost was able to beat the level in under 300 attempts in a practice run. An entire year would pass again, and in 2020, Era became the first person ever to beat the level in under 200 attempts. But wait, why does his personal best say 8%? Holy sh! Oh my god, 8%. This is where it gets a bit complicated. This 8% run, just like with Emirates 6% run, needs an asterisk. And to explain this asterisk, I will need to go into some core problems that this game has. You see, Era was playing on a slightly nerfed version of the level. <gasps> so he lied and cheated to everyone. What? No, shut up. This is a whole confusing mess of multiple accounts uploading different versions of the level, making it harder to find the original, but, this confusion was not the main reason why Era was playing on this slightly changed version. The real reason is something I absolutely hate talking about. Era was playing on a 120Hz screen. This means his inputs get translated into gameplay 120 times a second. This is double the refresh rate people had in the early years of Geometry Dash, giving him a big advantage. By now, in 2020, this was normal, however, and we even have people playing with 240Hz+. plus. Or if you're a freak, there's 500Hz. Apparently, it can, it can warp time and space. If you're on a device that runs on 60Hz, for example, you can press the jump button, but the input will only go through once the next frame has been reached. So you can see how having 120Hz can be a big advantage here. More frames means more chances for the game to react to your inputs. Now, you might be wondering why Era having a better monitor led him to using a slightly easier version of the level. <sighs> well, you see, the developer of this game never intended people to push the limits of difficulty this far. It probably was just supposed to be a casual game for shitty 60Hz mobile phones. Which is why during the development of this game, one thing led to another and somehow the physics calculations got tied to the amount of frames that you have. Ah! This means calculating things like the player's momentum can only happen on every frame that's being rendered. Since mobile phone users in 2013 never went above 60 hertz anyway, this never really was an issue. But we didn't stay on 60 hertz devices, did we? Which means that the moment players started playing on higher refresh rates, we also started calculating the physics and momentum more often per second. This leads to problems. 
Because of this weird behavior, certain levels can break for people with a very specific refresh rate. And this is what happened with error. It turns out on his 120Hz device, the momentum in physics got calculated in a way where he would always 100% of the time die to the first two spikes in a straight fly, no matter what he did. So he used a version that moved the first two spikes down a couple of pixels, making it possible for him to enter the straight fly to begin with. He says that on normal 60 Hz calculations, you wouldn't be able to die to these spikes anyway. So therefore it's not really a nerf, right? It's not easier. But I'm not really sure how true that is, because the game engine works in really mysterious ways and we have given up on trying to understand it years ago. So, now you know that a higher refresh rate monitor gives you more chances to react and jump per second. But it also comes with the negatives of sometimes making things harder or even straight impossible, like in our straight fly abomination over here. Now I never have to talk about Hertz again, and we're done with this issue for eternity. If you for some reason still have a question, write a letter to Joe Biden or something, I don't f***ing care. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was gonna put him in a uh, foot, foot. Anyway, 8%. Here we are, halfway into the straight fly. This was actually an insane achievement. And Error says it took him 35,000 attempts to get this far once. It seemed like people were chipping away percent after percent, but the level had a giant issue. A problem that ruined it for everyone that was still around trying. I've been kind of lying to you up until now. The reality of the situation was that with the introduction of update 2.0 in 2015, the level officially became impossible to beat. Or so people thought. Here's the thing. It's not actually impossible, but it's unrealistic to ask a human to do this. At least right now. I will go more into this at the end of the video, but for the sake of transporting ourselves into the player's mindsets back then, let's just say that it became impossible. Ever since 2015, people actually were playing a level that they knew they could not beat, no matter how long or how hard they tried. And all of that was because update 2.0 introduced a ton of core physics and gameplay changes, with the big deal breaker for Silent Clubstep being the layered orb update priority. Further into the level, you arrive at this mini gravity ball section. To pass it, you need to hit these floating orbs in a very specific way. These are not actually yellow orbs. They are a stack of multiple orbs on top of another. Before 2.0, the trick was to buffer your input after going down late so that the update order would choose the blue gravity orb instead of the yellow ones. It was clever trickery of the game engine's priorities. If you don't do this correctly, the update order will make you hit the yellow orb, leading to your death. Before 2.0, this was possible, but then orbs got changed. This means that no matter what you did, you would always hit this blue orb, making the section seem completely impossible. This layered orb technique is used again, way later in the level, so that makes it two parts that completely broke with the update. For five years, players were playing a level that was slowly breaking apart every update. It was all about seeing how far they could get. And in some weird parallel universe, where players miraculously pass the straight fly and manage to actually reach these layered orbs, this is where the story would end. But we don't live in that timeline. We live in the good timeline. On the 8th of June 2020, this video would appear on YouTube. The player Iced Cave managed to get into contact with the original creator of the level. Both of them knew the legacy this level had in the community, and together they decided it was time to put this issue to rest. While talking to Salent, Iced Cave explained that with game updates and players upgrading to higher refresh rate monitors, the level's playing field had shifted. They both proposed tons of fixes and changes, but what you need to know is that all of them were done in the spirit of keeping the original intended way to beat the level alive. They added visibility to sections that were in complete darkness. They also fixed the layered orbs, finally making them behave like they used to work before 2.0. And Salem did some tiny nerfs to certain parts because they were unfair to lower Hertz players. After everything was planned and organized, Salent knew what he had to do. He updated the level. And this video 
was the start of a new era. One day after the update, the player Septagon would show off his progress. He finished a level from 62%, meaning he placed a start position and played from there. This allows players to practice parts of a level without having to listen to annoying music that plays in practice mode. The crazy thing about this run is that Septagon was the first person to show recorded proof of someone beating the duel. The duel received no changes in the update, meaning this also was just as hard as before the update. Septagon had been playing the level for a really long time already, and it seems that the update got tons of old players motivated to play again. This duel of doom is actually ridiculously hard. If we had to rank all the parts in this level by difficulty, it would sit in the top 3, only to be stumped by the first chip part, obviously, and if we still were playing on the old version, the 8 chumps of hell actually would be harder than the duel but I'll get to those, don't worry. This part alone is considered a massive choke point in the level. Let me show you why. Going into this section, you touch these portals. One of them is the previously mentioned dual portal and the other one basically triples the speed that the level is played at. These two combined wouldn't be too hard, but what makes this section so ridiculous is the fact that you have to balance two different game modes on top of some of the level's tightest timings. Here, I'm using a cheat that shows me where the player's hitbox is for every frame that I play. Just look at this. There is no room for error. This section is so tight that people thought these were frame-perfect inputs in the early days. Septagon pulled an absolute chad move by making this the first big progress after the update. And people noticed. This video gained way more attention than the others I've mentioned. The update reminded players that this beast was lurking in the dark, and we would see tons of progress just roll out out of nowhere. But funnily enough, progress would only come from the players who had been hunting the level for years, and with their experience, they had a clear head start. I did it, are you serious? Just one day later, Iced Cave would be the first player to reach the drop of the level from the orb spam at 12%. This is another notorious joke point, mainly because of the jump right after the spam. But don't let that deceive you, the spam itself also can be really tough. Just like in the beginning of the level, you have to click really consistent and fast to make sure that you stay away from the death weeds? that are right above and below you. Doing this looks way easier than it actually is. And the most important part is getting the right exit out of the spam. The reason for that is this way too dank jump right after. Just look at this. Because the jump happens right in the mirror portal, you need to execute an almost frame perfect jump, completely blind. It's just about learning the timing and hoping for the best. Players told me that this jump is one of the hardest timings in the level, exactly because you need to do it blind. Ice Cave became the first player ever to do this entire section in one go, reaching the drop of the level. I sadly can't play the music of the level because it's copyrighted. But right around here is where it goes absolutely crazy. In just two days, these players had already dropped progress, which would have been ridiculous to claim three years ago. At this point, there were a bunch of people pushing the limits on the level, but the next big progress would come from Septagon on June 18th, where he would do 48 to 98. No! No! No, I messed up the memory! Oh my god! 48 to 98, are you kidding me? 50% of the level in one go, just done like that. To an outsider looking in, this was insane. This included the miniship section, the layered orbs at 60%, the insanely hard duel at 62%, the 8 jumps of hell, and the giant invisible maze at the end. Well, kinda. Oh my god! Right at the end of the level, the creator decided to have a one-on-one -on -one fist fight with the Grinch to find out who truly was the most evil creature in the land. I say this because the final part you have to pass is actually the easiest in the entire level. In theory. Now, you might be confused on why that's a sign of basically being the equivalent of Satan in Geometry Dash. You see, in a crazy alternate timeline where players would somehow gain superhuman capabilities and actually reach this part in a legit run, their nerves would basically be conducting World War III in their brain 
while they try to scramble their shaky hands together to not choke the 100%. Think about it. In over seven years of playing, you would be the first person to push this fire into the level. And you would come to the realization that this is it. This is the one chance you have to pull it off. If your brain cells wouldn't short circuit at that point, you wouldn't be human. Which is why it's so evil from Salent to make the last 20% of the level an invisible memory maze. This is what the player sees, and this is the invisible objects he's trying to avoid. The last 20% require the player to memorize a pattern of 10 numbers. You jump 4 times, you descend 1. Jump 3 times, fall 2. Jump 2 times, fall 6. Jump 15 times, fall 10. Jump 5 times, and descend the final 5 blocks. Imagine trying to remember and pull this off, while the nerfs in your brain are cosplaying the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. It's just pure evil, because if you mess up the pattern, you will die to an invisible ball in the end, no matter what. And that's what happened to Septagon on his 48-98% to run. The nurse probably got to him and made him jump 16 times here instead of 15 times, bringing him unavoidable death. No matter what, however, this was crazy. Sure, most of his run are the in quotation marks easier parts in Silent Clubstep. I just thought that making them this big makes sense. But do not forget that the duel is in there. And as I said before, it's the second hardest part in the level after the straight fly ship. This was impressive. And the craziest part was that Septagon wasn't done. You can hear it in his voice. Things were moving. Progress was happening. And now, players officially were at the verge of breaking the wall. A wall that stood in their way for over five years at that point. But they were this close. If they could break through the ship part, the wall would fall. And players would finally be able to test their skills on the later parts in the level. And I say this because five days later, Era would do this. With this achievement, players now had completed every part before the drop in two segments. Septagon with his 9% and Era with his 9 to 25 run. This is actually ridiculously hard because it includes two of the hardest individual timings in the entire level. One of them is the previously mentioned blind jump right after the orb spam. You, you dirty little scoundrel. The other one is the seemingly easy looking section. After hitting a really tight timing over this triple spike, you go blind because of the mirror portal. This makes seeing what's next really hard. Usually, players look for visual cues to calculate their jumps, but because of this mirror portal, it makes the next jump incredibly hard to set up. You might think to yourself, why, why doesn't he just let the cube slide onto the blue pad? Oh. You dumb cretin. Absolute bumbling buffoon. You need to jump because touching these blue pads too early sends you into the gravity switching portal, which in turn sends you to your doom. This jump all is about trying to squeeze yourself between the blue gravity switching portal and the death weeds. If you add on top of that that you're in the middle of a mirror portal transition, being completely blind and trying to line up the jump perfectly on top of that makes this entire part a really insane choke point in the level. So. With Era achieving 9 to 25%, players could theoretically make it to the drop if they just made it past the first chip part. But what about the parts after the drop itself? Well, a week later, Era would come in again and show that players were ready for it. Oh my god, that was a really good run. For one reason or another, the parts between 24 and 66 are considered some of the easier parts of the level. But still, we have learned time and time again that easier means nothing in Silent Clubstep. If someone could somehow chain these three runs together, it would equal a 66% run, which 
would just be mind-blowing. The first mini ship part features some very tight gaps, and the section right after requires perfect feel for how the ship behaves between gravity changes. Right after that, Ara had to pass the previously mentioned mini ball section that has the layered orbs, which got considerably harder after the update. After Ara survived those, he goes into a blind UFO section that just throws mirror portals at you as if they were the dressing for your favorite salad. Piece of shit! Surviving those, Era had to show even more miniship mastery until he reached the big layered orb maze, also previously mentioned. In this one, you need to memorize which of these orbs are the right ones, and you need to get the timing just perfect to not accidentally hit one of the wrong ones. In his run, he also managed to do this, making it look like a cakewalk. At this point, he could have been completely happy with his run, because next up, would be the big duel of doom. Because it is the second hardest section in the level, it would be perfectly normal to die on the first or maybe second jump. But the crazy thing was that he actually managed to get really far into this part as well, showing how the practice over the years was slowly paying off. He wasn't actually the first to do a run like this. Almost a month earlier, Septagon did 24 to 63, dying instantly into the duel, showing just how much this part can be a choke point. Players had been grinding these sections for years, and it felt like everything was slowly falling into place. In a real run, the job would be all about keeping focus. These parts are not as impossible as the others, but I can see them going really wrong if you let the excitement of passing the first 24% get to you. However, getting anywhere past 24% means beating the straight fly, and getting past these incredible choke points, which up until now has shown to be the greatest challenge in the level. But on September 17th, all of this would change. Hyperbola whipped out the sledgehammer, and that was it. The first player to break the mental barrier that had plagued the community for five years. To him? Roughly 10,000 attempts is all it took. This achievement was what I consider to be the kickoff in the quest to actually beat Silent Clubstep. Up until now, players had just been throwing attempts against the wall, trying to see what they could do. But now, the tide had changed. Hyperbola did what everyone wanted to see, and he did it in less than four months. I'm gonna find a bunch of pipe bombs in my mailbox for saying this, but I love levels that have stuff like this. One or maybe two sections that just spike in difficulty. It's always such an adrenaline rush when you finally pass the hardest choke point in a level. And the same thing goes for actually watching other players pass that choke point. Being a spectator and watching live streams of players trying to push the boundaries is something really magical that I hope this community never loses. When the streamer finally makes it past the impossible part and you can see the chat erupting and cheering, as if we were one community united together for the common goal of pushing the boundaries of this game. These sections become so memorable that they sometimes fuse with the level's identity. When you think of Silent Clubstab, you think of the first ship part, the insane quad spike jumps and the eight jumps of hell. Shut up, I will get to those. <coughs> Fuck! To me, sections like these give levels more personality and something to fight towards, something to overcome. And Hyperbola had just done exactly that. He was one of the players that got inspired to play the level because of the update. He thinks a big reason as to how he was able to do it so quickly was exactly because he was so new to Silent Clubstep. He didn't have to endure years of this straight fly section just towering over him, messing with his mindset. To him, it seemed doable the moment he reached 9% almost two months before. And that is all that he needed. But he wasn't done. To make this video, I contacted most of the players that were involved in trying to take this level down over the years. When I asked them who they think I should definitely mention in the video, Hyperbola's name constantly popped up. And there is a very good reason for that. Aw, oh, come on. Alright. With this run, Hyperbola became the first player that had reached a drop in just two segments. It was just about connecting these two runs together to make it happen. But before he would do that, he had some unfinished business.
40 to 100. First in the world, baby, let's go. Hyperbola was unstoppable. With this 48 to 100% run, he basically cleaned up Septagon's failed run from five months before. At this point, he showed absolute mastery of every section in this level, and the only untouched parts left standing were 25 to 48. If he was able to pull that off, that run would make him the first person ever to have completed the entire level in four segments. <laughs> Nobody was prepared for what happened next. This. 75% of the level, just like that. He skipped the four segments and jumped straight to three. A single person was able to do the entire level in three segments now. It was at this moment where the wider mainstream community slowly started getting more and more engaged with the level. The video blew up. To this day, it's his most viewed video and sits at 130,000 views. It reached far into the mainstream player base and I can imagine it left a mark in a lot of people's memories. This was one of the first moments where a bunch of us went... Wait... People are actually playing this level? And they just did 75%? What? This run covers everything from the drop to the end. I don't want to downplay this achievement, but this run really showed how unbalanced the level actually was. I was told by the players that a run from 0 to 25% is just as hard as a run from 25 to 100%. It shows that all ultimate choke points are bunched up in the first quarter of the level. Well, almost all of them. Don't forget about this beast. Every time this guy would upload a video, it felt like Silent Clapstep slowly was being taken apart one by one. And I mean that in the most literal sense, March 30th. 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13
he was the first person to give Hyperbola a run for his money. It seemed like these two were the top contenders, but I think there was nothing that could have prepared the community for what was next. I got to the drop. What? I'm not fucking kidding. I just got to the drop. Oh my god! After six years of 1% improvements, another new player would appear and completely stun the community. Paco. Paco, eh? Paco? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Going from 15 to 25 in just six days was the biggest jump in percentage yet. Before reaching 25, Paco actually had a really tight history with this level. But before I can really get into that, I think it's finally time. We need to talk about the eight jumps of hell. The 8 jumps of hell are the 8 mini cube jumps you can find right before the giant maze at the end. These 8 jumps alone share just as much history as the entire rest of the level. Really early on in the level's lifespan, if you would mention the name Silent Clubstep to anyone, the first thing they would think of is the straight fly at the start. And the 8 jumps of hell. They have become so synonymous with the level that you can't mention one without the other. But. Why is that? As I explained, in the early days of the game, people were playing on pretty poor devices. And as you know now, anyone playing on a 60Hz device has an incredible disadvantage in this game. This means that back when the first few players discovered this level, the moment they reached this section, they were confronted with a reality check. A reality check that at the time was considered just as shocking as the first straight fly. You see, there was a tiny problem back then that made doing all of these jumps in a row, well, how would I say it? Impossible. Here, I turned on a cheat that allows me to slow down the game. I also turned on a second cheat that shows the traject, 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 the fuck. I also turned on the second cheat that shows the trajectory of the player if I were to jump on this current frame. So if I press jump here, I would land there. Pretty simple. Let's descend into the depths of 60 Hertz and check out the eight jumps of hell. Wait, there's not a single frame where the jump looks possible. Unless I go into practice mode. So, what's going on here? Well, the creator of the level used the practice mode to check each and every individual jump to see if it's actually possible to pass it. The problem arises when you find out years later down the line that the practice mode makes the players behave differently than they would in a normal run. The issue boils down to frame alignment. <sighs> Back to the drawing board, remember this? What if there was a way to shift them over just a bit? Let's say using something like a checkpoint. You know, the ones in the practice mode? This is where it all went wrong, because Sayland used the practice mode to check if the jumps were possible. These checkpoints realign and shift you all over the place on a micro scale. Don't ask me why, this already gives me a big enough of a headache, just leave it. This means that when Sayland checked to see if these jumps are possible, the shifting and moving and huffing and puffing made it seem like they were possible on 60 Hz, but in a normal run, they actually weren't. It's nearly impossible to change the frame alignment during a normal run. You would have to hope for a random lag spike or a cosmic gamma ray bit flip, which is not really something that can happen multiple times, perfectly placed between these jumps and during a real run. So, conclusion? In the early days when everyone was still playing on 60 Hz, this section seemed completely impossible. People thought they knew the jumps were possible because of the practice mode weirdness, but in reality, they just weren't. This is why this section became known as the 8 jumps of hell. Over the years, high refresh rate monitors slowly made this section easier, meaning now with 144Hz+, it was possible to be frame aligned for them every time. 
The stigma around this pirate stayed in the community, however, so much so that with time, they would rival the first chip pirate in terms of infamy. It became a popular challenge in 2019 when Iced Cave and Septagon both were trying to become the first players to beat the 8 jumps of hell in one go. After roughly 12,000 attempts, Iced Cave became the first person to pass the 8 jumps of hell in his 71 to 100% run. But because it was such an infamous section, it spawned tons of offshoots and variations. For example, players would cut out the 8 jumps of hell and upload them alone as its own level. This would only advance and manifest further when Iced Cave decided he wanted a bigger challenge. So he created the 16 jumps of hell, which basically is the 8 jumps of hell, but you have to do them back to back in one run. This challenge would get the name Final Destination. And this is exactly where we loop back to Silent Club Step. Because guess who the first person to pass the 16 jumps of hell was? Paco. <gasps> oh my god. Paco had been deeply intertwined into this level's legacy the moment she verified Final Destination. And it was exactly this challenge that made Paco move on to the actual level, to chase a bigger legacy. Which eventually led us to here, 25%. The community was stunned, but we were all here for this. At this point, thousands of players had their eyes glued to these names to see who would push it even further. It felt like all the pieces were moving into place. Six years of pain and suffering between old and new players. It was all coming together. Oh, what? I just got 27. Vision would show he's not a one-hit wonder. With this run, he officially had become the first player to beat Silent Club Step in just two segments. One player, two runs. With this level. At this point, we were all freaking out. This was absolute insanity. In so many conversations that I had on Discord, were old OG players joining in and saying, hey, have you seen this? On his 27% video, Vision states that it took him 220,000 attempts to get to this point. When I said earlier that he's grinding in the background, I meant it. And unbelievably, this was still only the start. I got 65 on Silent Club Sub. I got 65. It was right here where the entire community activated. This was a declaration of war. Vision and the others had pushed this level to its absolute limits. And in turn, the level pushed the players to their absolute limits. But they would not let a measly few jumps stop them. Not when they were this close. The determination was there. The effort was there. The skill was there, 370,000 attempts in. At this point, the only thing standing between the players and 100% was this dual section and the eight jumps of hell. When I mentioned that those were choke points, I meant that in the worst way possible. 65. What? No fucking way.
that was from Zero? Yeah! What? Oh my god! What? What? Okay. <laughs> what the hell? I cannot even begin to tell you how big of a moment this was for the community. So many people woke up that day, checked their phone and saw that it had finally happened. This level was lingering in the back of people's minds for almost 8 years at that point. Having someone tell you, Oh, dude, have you seen that sign in clubs have got been- What the f It felt like they were trying to pull your leg. But no, here it was, right in front of you. It happened, but it didn't happen just because of Paco. So many of these players that I've mentioned all knew each other at this point. They had become friends, constantly pushing each other to their limits. I truly hope that this is an experience that bonds them together as friends for a really long time. However, the story is not yet over. In fact, someone watching this video right now could be the one to take the next step. All these different versions and the updates actually breaking the level over the years still makes me and a lot of others feel like we aren't done yet. What Paco did was absolutely insane and there's not a lot of people out there that have the determination and the willpower to pull through with something like this. But the truth is that the level that Paco beat was different from the version that was uploaded in 2015. These changes all were backed by the original creator and they were all done with the intent of restoring how the level was in 2015. However, there's also some changes that made the level ever so slightly easier. With the biggest example, of course, being in the first chip part. At the end, these four spikes were changed to fit in with the others, which did make the straight fly the tiniest amount easier. This is actually why some players chose to play on the broken version of the level. This one has all of the layered orb issues and is as close as we can get to how it used to be. And players have been absolutely going crazy on this one too. This is how the progress on the unnerved version would look like right now. You have Parker with a 48 to 100 run. That's 50% of the level just done. And then we also have Vision with a 11 to 51% run. Also almost half of the level just done right there. And we have Vision with a 12% run. This means players have completed the unnerved version in 3 segments. It's just about chaining it together now. But wait! I thought the layered orbs were impossible! <sighs> Here's the thing, I, people found a way around them and it's actually quite crazy. Sure, you might be pressing the wrong orb at first, but what if you were able to click fast enough to loop through all of the orbs until you get to the right one before it's too late? That's how the level theoretically became possible, but it still kinda stinks that you have to do this workaround instead of how the creator intended the orbs to be. So, about that, I got some news. While making this video, I got into contact with all of the important figures around this level. And I might have indirectly inspired a new update to the level. That's right, up now on the servers is a new version of Silent Clubstep. This version aims to be the closest we just physically can get to how the level was in 2015. This means that the ship part in the start has its spikes back, it means that the 8 jumps of hell have been reverted to how they used to be in 2015, which also means they are impossible on 60Hz again. And it's all that guy's fault! All in all, this is where we are today. The official version of Silent Clubstep has been beaten. The old unnerved version also had tons of activity over the years, but now we have a new version that just for the historical value alone, I would love to see beaten. If there's anyone out there who thinks they have the guts to try this, the hunt is on. Now, if you excuse me, I got my own thing to hunt. Are you Heinrich Rudolf Hertz? Yes? What are you doing in my room? Ah! Ah! 
<laughs> I'm being hunted. Haha. <laughs> ha. Are you actually doing a sponsorship right now? No, I don't like chess. <laughs> ah! I believe. I can't believe this world. <laughs> Do I fucking put you in that hobby or not? I can't decide. <laughs>